All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first Breakfast with the Experts for our spring semester. Um, it is my pleasure this morning to introduce Mr. Randy Hensley. Uh, Mr. Hensley comes to us from uh, Coalition for Kids. Uh, uh, just to give you a background on Coalition for Kids, it is an after-school literacy program, a faith-based after-school literacy program that focused on, focuses on underserved children in the Johnson City area. Um, it started in 1998 with about 25 kids. Uh, now in 2017, there's 10 locations and they have about 400 kids. And it's and they're looking to, I think there's a position to grow here pretty, pretty soon as well. So you guys are going to hear about that this morning. Um, let's see, uh, Randy also is the pastor of the Brock, Brock, Brock Fellowship, which started in 1994. Did I get that right? Yeah, 94. Okay, good. Um, he's also married 27 years to Melanie. They have six kids. He beat me. Uh, and, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, let me just say this. My, my, my first introduction to Randy was coming over to uh, talk about internships and he thought he'd be really good speaker. He had a big battle sword in his office and uh, uh, just thought he'd be a pretty dynamic guy to have here. So uh, please welcome Mr. Hensley. Uh, it is not a great reward to, to beat one with kids, I'll say that. Uh, six kids is not an easy task, so I just warn you about that. There is a uh, there is a cost to doing something like that. I had uh, uh, her first kid, who's 28, uh, was a little girl, and my wife wanted a boy. And so, well, unfortunately, this is, the, this is where you go off. Um, let me turn my phone off. Unfortunately, um, her father died when she was eight years old by accident, and her brother died a year later to the day by another accident. And so in her head, as some of us tend to do, uh, she wanted a boy to remember them back. So our second child came, and it was a girl. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I mean, who wants a boy? When you got dads get girls, it's like, this is a cool place to be. And so the third child came, and it was a girl. <laughs> and I said, it's possible that we've had enough kids, don't you think? It's going to be pretty tough to, to walk through this. And so our fourth child came, and it was a girl. <laughs> and I said, she said, I want a boy. And I said, well, this is really a, a struggle. Uh, I'm feeling like it's a struggle anyway. And so we... We just, I said, honestly, I said, you know, I, I need to think about this. So I said, can we please get a boy? And of course, we got a boy, a fifth one. Uh, when that boy got here, um, William became known as Prince William. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I thought, he's really going to be spoiled in a way which is going to ruin his life. Obviously, four girls, one boy, and she's wanted that boy all this time. So, uh, two years later, Really, uh, within the next year, we became, um, I had been associated with a young man uh, at the coalition. He would come to church on Sundays, um, lived in a really bad uh, community, bad home life, um, was probably 16 years old at the time, and I heard a rumor uh, through the children that we worked with at the coalition that uh, there was a new little girl in town and that she was having sex with all boys in the grass, in the fields, in the apartments where we lived. And the next thing I learned was, y'all have no clue how this is connected to you. It's okay, hang in there, I got you. The next uh, thing that took place was, um, I found out that this young man that I had known for a long time and really had a struggle in his life, uh, connected with her and they were living together. She was 13 and he was uh, 16 or 17, and they were living with his mom and her boyfriend right down the street from my office. And within that year, um, after we had our 50th William, she got pregnant. So she's 13, pregnant, with a 16-year-old uh, boyfriend. And she has him when she's 14. And we got to go to the hospital with him because... Their families so hated each other that they didn't know how to deal with this. So we had an African American boy, a uh, white girl, and, and they didn't like each other, families. So we went to the hospital, and my wife says, There's something about this baby that we're going to be a part of. Uh, he 
year later, um, they put the grandmother in jail for abusing the great grandmother. When they put the great grandmother in the hospital, they had to put the mother and the one year old, therefore a 14 year old, a one year old, in uh, foster care. Because they had nowhere to go. When they put them in foster care, they found out that the baby had never made a connection to the mother. So here is an infant, a year old or less. Oh, you got it. Oh yeah, right. Okay, I was, I was a student one. Um, so they took the. They realized the one girl had not made a connection to the mother, and at that point, if you've never experienced this picture, um, that baby was about twelve months old. They called us because the mom and dad wouldn't didn't want that baby going to either family. They so despised each other, and they said, would you all take this child temporarily? And we said, yes. So we got this baby that when he came into our house, when he sat on the floor, it's all he did. He never cried, never made a noise, never laughed, no facial expressions, because he had never experienced any form of love from his mother, because she had been abused by her mom, who was the abuser of the family. So she didn't know how to love him. She just knew how to carry him from one spot to the next and hand them off. So after about six weeks, um, Dominic began to respond to my wife and the way that she cared for him. And if, at that point, if she didn't hold him, he cried. And he cried for six weeks nonstop if she wasn't holding and somewhere around that window of time, and I'm not turning this into any crazy story, but I have a faith background. Uh, my friend kept saying to me, you're supposed to be the father to this child. And I kept saying, he said, God wants you to. And I'd say, dude, God ain't talking to me, so leave God out of this. Okay? And I got five. I don't need six. And, uh, and, and, and one Sunday, he walked up to us and said, I know you're tired, but you can't quit. He said, we just won't pray for you. So they said, we, they prayed a prayer of encouragement over us. And, and we carried the baby to the van, put him in the car seat, and he never cried another day. Weirdest, weirdest thing ever seen. He's 13 now. What we found out was that he had gotten shaken at six months old. He's 100% brain damage. Where his grandmother had shaken him when she babysat him. And his brain got damaged from the front to the back. That's how you know it's, it was shaken. Um, He's not supposed to be able to walk, to eat without a feeding tube, or uh, talk. But at 13, he won't quit talking. <laughs> he runs into everything, and he eats like a horse, but doesn't gain weight because he's got a lot of damage and a lot of. He takes medicine all day long, four times a day, 36 pills. Um, all kinds of treatments, that type of stuff. But he is uh, our sixth child, which kept my fifth child being spoiled. Um, so we've had Dominic for 12 years, and that's how we got our sixth child. I um, didn't really have an intent to tell that story, but like I said, my presentations aren't always planned very well. That's why I refuse PowerPoint program. Um, so now, I did that story for, I guess, a couple reasons. I've used that story before. Uh, one is, uh, one of the reasons we do the Coalition for Kids, and please hear me when I say that, um, I was, I'm the founding uh, director of the coalition that was 18 years ago. By being the founding director 18 years ago uh, in Johnson City, I may very well be one of the most senior uh, directors of any nonprofit in the area. It, it is uh, it's shocking to me. I'm, this, is a, this is a life lesson for you. You can truly be great if you just go to work every day. It, it's shock because all I've done is go to work every day, and now all of a sudden I'm, I'm the only guy that's still at his job. Every other nonprofit has exchange directors multiple times, time after time after time. Guess who has grown the most? We have. Guess what? Consistent leadership. Not necessarily me, but being one guy there all the time, it makes a massive difference to 
and not only have consistent leadership, but consistent thinking. That's the same way, nonstop, always trying to figure out how to go forward, always trying to figure out how to do it better, always trying to figure out uh, what your goals are and how to verbalize it and how to get more people on board. I used to say that the reason we do what we do when we started was because there, we don't need more 13-year-olds to get abused that the school system never sponsored. You see, we got Dominic because a 13-year-old never got spotted that she was living in an abused household. After we had Dominic, we went to their house one day. They lived in a trailer in Johnson County, right across the Carter County line. I've never been there before. I'm from Mountain City. Can you say Mountain City? I'm just seeing if you're a little wet. Um, I'm, you know, that's right, interaction. I, I saw it in a, in a church service one time where they make you say it back. That's kind of weird. Isn't it? Uh, yeah. So here was, so so we pulled up to a trailer. This is a, uh, this is a true story. I wish you had a picture. I wish you had a PowerPoint. We pull up to a trailer that the ground is nothing but dirt, mud, or dirt if it rains mud. The trailer looks like it's about 30 years old. It's for it. The trash, this is the, the walk in the front door of the trailer. When you open the door, the trash pile right outside the door was probably six foot tall. They literally would open the door and just throw their trash out. The dogs were tied at the corners on chains or ropes that would run just far enough for them not to touch each other, but they could do all a major distance as far as their activity goes. When we walked in, they had about a thousand um, videos against the wall. VCR, you know, stuff. Didn't want to sit on the chairs. The bugs, the nastiness, the, and I'm sitting here thinking, this was the worst living condition, and I've seen some rough stuff if you've ever gone to a Tyler Apartments. Does anybody know where Tyler Apartments is here? Tom City? Okay. Y'all need an education. Yeah, no, you need a real education. I appreciate what these guys are doing, but you need a real education, okay? The, um, this goes back to the reason we started Coalition. Tyler Apartments is the only reason the Coalition existed then. Because um, there was a man who was a mentor of mine who uh, was given a, a pastorate of a church that was right beside Tyler Apartments. And this is how we started. This is a cool story. He said uh, when he got to that church, that church idea was they had hired an architect to build a wall to protect it from Tyler Apartments. Sounds like a church, right? Isn't this a good story? And, yeah. And he said, well, why are we building a wall? Why, are, why don't we do something to build a relationship? And so a church of 50 people with no money and a few old people no big deal, Dr. Wyckoff. I'm not talking about old people in a bad way. And a few, I'm just kidding, okay? And, 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 a, and a few old people, and I'm talking, these guys had nothing, no capacity. They got together and they said, what can we do that it would take a miracle to make happen? And here's what they came up with. A 20-year plan that said three times. I want to build a playground in that apartment complex that we're going to keep up. I don't know if you understand playgrounds and the cost of playgrounds, but they are tens of thousands of dollars from a group of people that had nothing. They wanted to build a, a, a building that would hold, that they wanted to call it a prayer place, but it's really a, a like a, 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 a clothing exchange where you could come and buy clothes and work for 50 cents or food, get food, and, and people would help you with whatever your life's issues were. And they wanted to start a community center for children. Okay, that was their 20-year plan. That they couldn't do. There's no way. Within the first five years, they built a playground, and they started. They bought this little property with this building. Today's on God's corner. So if you have like clothing or books or food items, you can take there, and then they'll distribute it out to the community. And right down below there, we started a program called the Coalition for Kids that started working with only kids from Tyler Apartments. That's why we started. Because one guy, a small group of people, said we got to do something to make a difference. With no money, no capacity, and no collaboration from the community. And then he said, Who, how are we going to do this? And they got a few people together that started the board of directors of the Coalition for Kids. And within that board of the Coalition for Kids became um, some folks that are still serving on that board today. Uh, Mitch Cox is one of them. He would be considered the founder 
Um, he was our financial influencer. I don't know how many of you have ever thought about going in the nonprofit world, but I get interviewed on a regular basis every year from people who want to start something. They always say, how did you do this? And I always say, you've got to have somebody that financially undergirds you on the front end for at least 10 years. And they go, well, I, well, okay, how do you do that? Well, I'm not sure how you do that. Um, you know, you have to have a good idea that's got a good capacity for results of impact in somebody that you think needs impact and that somebody else will say, I agree. Does that make sense? And, and here's what we had. We had kids that had nowhere to go because they couldn't ride a bus to the boys' club. They couldn't get to the girls' club because the buses wouldn't run after they closed, so they couldn't get back home, so they couldn't go. So they had this whole community of people within this one apartment complex that had nowhere for their children to go. They got a couple hundred apartments. It's called Tyler Apartments. It's the worst living conditions in Johnson City in a housing authority, except it's privately owned. It is the oldest privately owned sub state subsidized uh, housing uh, facility in the state of Tennessee. Now, I want you to get in your mind what it means about being the oldest. That ain't cool no more. It ain't historic, okay? It means run down. It means painted on the outside, but not on the inside. I, I've done funeral services in apartments with people hanging out windows smoking cigarettes because they couldn't go to the funeral home because I knew the families and they knew I did the preaching thing and they said, would you not go? It, it's some of the worst conditions in the world. And so we started the coalition because those kids didn't have anywhere to go. Nothing else. There was never a plan to get to 400. Just like there was never a plan to get to six at my house. I only wanted one. <laughs> okay? But we got to six without a plan. We got to 400 without a plan. But the deal was that as things went, we were, in a sense, uh, focused on how do we change as times go and how does our thinking change as times go. And so just as, as a dad and a mom, we looked after one and said, yeah, we can do two now. We took on 25 kids without our apartments our first year, and in our second year, we took on you know, 25 more, and we raised a little more money. We had $130,000 on our first budget. Today, we've got 1.2 million. That comes in. And people say, he is so good working with children. And I go, I wish I could work with children. All I do is try to raise money, because that's what you do when you're... I, I get people all the time that walk in and go... I just think I want to work with children. I say, how much money do you want to make? I go, is seven fifty okay an hour? Well, they go, I can't do that. Well, I said, well, maybe you can come in on a supervisor's level. You can make nine or to twelve dollars an hour there. And they said, well, that'd be closer. I said, but you don't get to work with children then. You have to work with adults who work with children. Okay, and they go, well, I don't know. I thought you were called to work with children. Now you want to work with adults? And, oh, this is really about money, right? <laughs> You know why I said that? Because many of you will fool yourself on what the truth is that you want to do. Let me tell you something my mentor told me when I started the coalition. He said, if this isn't really what you're about, it will eat your lunch and spit you out. Because the poor will never leave us. And that's the truth. And he said, if this is not your passion, I promise you they will destroy you because they will never quit coming. And if you want me to get, pick up my phone and show you the text, the lady who doesn't have electricity was yesterday morning. Uh, one came by yesterday afternoon. Um, my kid, I can't get him to uh, mind. Uh, I'm about to lose my apartment. Uh, and they just go on and on. This is after 18 years. If you step in the world to truly help those who can't help themselves, I promise you, you better mean it. Because if you don't, you'll be like every other social worker that walks in and out in whatever category. You'll last for three years and you'll go on your way and say, this wasn't for me. But I will tell you, you got to step into it to find out whether it's truly yours or not. You can't just guess at it. But once you step into it, when you start helping people, there will be no other job you can do that will create in you a greater purpose of fulfillment when it comes to walking, when you go home and walk in your house and going, that was an impact on somebody's life today. That was really kind of cool. Today, my kids, when they get to the coalition, here's what we are. We are there simply, we are simply their family. When, as we know, 42% of the kids in Washington County in first, second, third grade do not read on scale, 97% of the kids in the coalition read on scale in third grade. You know why 97% of my kids do and 42% of their kids don't? There's only one difference. 
and it's way too simple. So educators sometimes have a real problem with me when it comes down to this, because I would tell you it's really, really simple. It's time. Expectations on boundaries. And it's not if you're going to do your homework, it's when are you going to get it done. And we put people with them. And so when you walk in their program, we simply become their family. Here's one of the coolest things in the world that people never see who we are. They have a place that they sit just like you are right now. There's nobody in this room sitting here nervous about being in this space. You are safe. Our kids do not go home and feel safe. Not our kids. You might know what that's like because some of you in here, odds or statistics wise, you grew up that way. My kids, I would say 70% of my kids are a little uncomfortable when they go home and who's going to be there and what's going to be happening. But when they come to coalition, they feel just like you do right here. Bored at the guy who's talking. Are you awake at all? Come on. Are you awake at all? All right. So, so they walk in, they feel safe. As they feel safe, they respect the people that draw their lines. We have kids that don't behave. There's no doubt. But there's only about 10% of them. And our kids do what they're expected to do because we do it over and over and over and over every day. The same way, the same way, the same way, the same way. Sometimes it's just new activity. So we work really hard at our education focus. And our education focus goes like this. It's got a name. That doesn't matter. You're not going to grasp that. Awesome Kids Club has got AKC. We, we, we uh, use letters on all of them, AKC. And so they come in right after school. And we do this in housing authorities. Uh, we'll use church buildings. We're not in any right now. We use the elementary schools in the city. And now we've got a brand new facility over on Susanna Street. Does anybody know where Susanna Street is? Does anybody know where the Coalition for Kids is? All right, can we get them A's? <laughs> Does anybody know where Wataga or the P's is? That's another thing. Um, so anyway, we're near the mall. How about that? The case I'll books. Let you <laughs> you got the case books over there. <laughs> case books, uh, the mall, Waffle House. I'll get you on that one, right? Everybody knows the Waffle House. All right, just forget it. Um, we're across down. We'll get up. Um, and we just got a brand new facility donated to us. Okay, after 17 years, a guy said, I'm supposed to, can I say it that way? I'm supposed to do this, and he bought um, the old Trash City Christian School property, which is a 33,000 square foot to build a facility, one with a big gymnasium and a kitchen. You got to come by and check all that out in the classroom. It was a formerly a school, and, and a second building that we turned in, uh, it was a brick building, one's a metal building, one's nowhere in the other, nine acres of land. He bought that for about $700,000. We did a renovation for about $700,000. And then he said, I want you to have this and bring your program into it. And I said, great. That happened about a year ago, uh, last March when it comes down to it. So not about a year ago. So we moved into that facility, and that was really cool because it's a really nice place to operate out of. But the reality is we, we're, we're almost at max capacity within the facility, and we have kids in programs outside, like at Mountain View Elementary School, uh, Keystone Housing Project over at South Side Elementary School. We continue to have programs outside because our only growth capacity is outside of the facility. But that's what we do. Our kids get out of school wherever they are, and they go into, if they're at Keystone, they get off the bus and they go into the space that we have for them. If they come to our place, they go to the gym, they get a snack. And then once they get a snack, and they get done, they have a little talk time, guess where they go? Come on, I really try to guess. I know it's a real tough question. <laughs> That's correct. What? Say it really loud, like you're really meant to be. Oh, you good job. Give her a hand. She is so strong today. Homework. That's right. Y'all knew that, didn't you? Right? She's going, please don't point at me. I don't want to talk this morning. It's 8 o'clock. If you do homework, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, I mean, they're 7 years old or 8 years old or 9 years old. First through 8th grade. We've gone two grades in the last year. We may go tonight and stop, but I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And I need a clock just to keep up with where I'm at. So um, they, they walk through the process of coming in, they get their snack, uh, then they go into homework time, and homework time orients from everything from reading, special reading programs, because we can kind of focus on reading a lot. But it's really about all their homework, and that can, different things can happen during that time, especially on Fridays, because what, what happens with kids on Fridays and homework? That's right, there is not. So what do you do then? Well, that's when you do extra curricular programming, such as uh, coming up. We'll talk about this later, but this is some of the things. Um, uh, teaching kids what good touch, bad touch is. Um, Hands-on Museum brings their mobile truck in, and they do a program for our kids. 
Um, we can do anything from uh, uh, character teaching, behavior teaching, how to deal with social settings, um, all kinds of different nationally accredited programming or curriculum that we will buy and bring in and be taught with. We just got a $50,000 grant to buy, uh, purchase items to create a STEM lab. Um, the STEM lab will have everything from a 3D printer to a flat simulator, uh, robot, and robotics programming. Um, to uh, a, a music recording studio um, and an energy program. So our kids will have access to something that probably no other elementary school kids will have access to. And that'll be kind of cool when, when the schools are asking us if they can come to our place, won't it? Um, and, but anyway, I'm sorry, you all are really kind of dead. Did y'all ever kind of smile and laugh? Or did y'all ever like, this school really like it was when I grew up? I thought it was going to be more fun this day. Um, so, so anyway, so, you know, then there's, now all that happens on Fridays when you're not doing homework because you got to do something and you need to continue to teach them. Now, some of the things we're going to do uh, deal with um, smoking cessation and uh, obesity, uh, you know, uh, prevention, uh, nutrition, teaching, but we still do a lot of that anyway. We're just going to focus more on it coming up in the future, uh, in the close future as far as that goes. So they get done, uh, they work through their homework. Um, they get done with homework, they can sometimes have some extra time. And according to the site, the facility, and the administration, uh, that, excuse me, that they have, they can get some free time. They can, if they have enough, they'll go to the gym. At between 5 and 5.30, we end that program. It's over. And kids go home. Or kids stay at the facility that we have on site. But if you're in a school, they won't let you stay long. So you're out. So you either get picked up by your parents, or you get on our bus, and get bus to our facility, where we have supper waiting. Full supper every night. Just like a family sit down, you go through, you get your green beans and your mashed potatoes and a good biscuit uh, and chicken salad. Um, I'm just kidding on chicken salad. Um, <laughs> hot dog, get by that corn dog, right? Maybe a piece of pizza. Um, and, and they have supper, and they do supper between 5.30 and 6, sometimes 6.20. I'm not always sure about those times because we're running about 150 to 200 kids or so uh, through that door. And then they break up in different groups according to age and, and usage of the facility. And then they do all these extracurricular things. Now those extracurriculars at that point in time can either be done by my staff or by volunteers. So if you really love cooking, and it looks like you're probably a good, right? Am I right? I was kidding. <laughs> can you not play along a little and act like I can? I know what I'm talking about. So, um, so if you know how to, if you like to cook, let's just pretend, okay? So if you like to cook, and, and you said, uh, I think I'll volunteer the coalition. I wonder if I could teach some kids how to cook. I love cooking spaghetti, and here's what we would do. We'd say, so how often do you want to do this? Well, I've only got like a day a week. Well, how long do you have? Well, about an hour. It'd take about an hour to do it. Um, okay, how many kids do you want to work with? Three or six or 30. I don't know whatever the number is, but okay, six, you want to work with six kids? Okay, here's our window. When's our window? It's not during our education time. It's not during the daytime. They're in school. It is between after supper and between 7.30 and 8 when we take kids home. And we say, okay, come in every Wednesday or every Thursday or every Tuesday for six weeks because that's all you want to do it. And we'll give you three, six, or 30 kids to do that project, whether it's playing guitar, or learn how to play the piano, or play the drum, get your hair cut. We got people who come and cut hair. We got dental people who come in and check the teeth and do teeth cleaning. Uh, you name it, in some form, at some time, we've probably done it or we want to, as far as that goes. And if it's warm weather, you know what a kid wants to do, right? Just want to go outside, dude. Okay, you know, can we go outside? We built a uh, $85,000 playground in four and a half hours. Okay, it's really cool. 250 people in four and a half hours from nothing but a plot of ground um, uh, and started at 10 o'clock and finished at, uh, I guess it's five o'clock, finished around 3.30 that afternoon. 250 people on a grant we got from a, a, a foundation called Kaboom. We have this brand, brand new playground on our property and we did that from, you know, part of this title says, uh, how do you bring together regional support from collaborating with the community? 250 people just came and organized, put together, and we built this playground. One of the coolest pictures in the world to watch this movie go together from nothing but grass 
do a full play to play here on our outside uh, property uh, as far as our elementary green space. And that's what our kids did. They did that until about 7.30, whatever that is. It could be basketball, it could be kickball, it could be ETSU's uh, soccer team coming in or, or women's basketball coming in. They can all do special projects. We run about six to 800 volunteers a year. Um, and we allow them to do everything from service projects to cleaning the floors to working with the kids um, as far as that goes. And then summertime shows up and everybody knows what we do at summertime, right? We shut down, take a break, and just who, who needs us during the summertime? Um, yeah, it's always weird to me out programs that have shut down during the summertime when the kids are home alone all day long. Um, and so we open up in the summertime from 7.30 in the morning to 5.30 in the evening. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you our program's free. Nobody pays. I have a fee system. It's just everybody lands in the no charge. So, just so you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a, yeah, there's a fee system. So if you're middle class, yeah, you're going to give me money. But, you know, it's real weird how people run in groups. Isn't it? I could really get into some stuff here to mess with you just a little bit. I'm not going to. Um, but, but I would tell you that all our kids are free. Uh, Ninety-seven and a half percent of our kids are totally free uh, lunch at school, and that's basically what we go by. We're DHS. You know what that is? Anybody know what that? Is? Department of Human Services license, uh, and that's uh, any daycare that you know of has to be licensed. That's that Tennessee through the Department of Human Services. We're also DOE licensed. Anybody know what that is? <coughs> Say it loud, bro. Education. Yeah, Department of Education. And that's what your schools have to be uh, licensed under. And we're licensed by both those. We're also the only place licensed by both those in the area um, in that regard. But mainly because it's really expensive to keep up because your facilities have to maintain a level of criteria that's really kind of tough when it comes to the state. And so we walk that out. Um, it also helps us uh, some with some funding. And all our snacks and all our suppers, we get fun, we get uh, reimbursed from the government um, because of that it creates about a seventy to eighty thousand dollar impact on us. Uh, a snack can get reimbursed about about eighty six cents. A snack and a meal can get anywhere from a dollar eighty five to two ten um, as far as reimbursement. So every meal we serve gets reimbursed, but they also have criteria for every meal has to be a certain amount of everything. So it's all nutrition oriented. It's all required to uh, check the criteria to hit certain levels of, of nutritional values. We have to walk down all that. You can't just be in point dog right? We did that when we started, by the way. Um, it was it was corn dogs, not dogs every day. When we began, I, what I did was I would go to the community from churches and companies, and I would say, if y'all would come and feed supper, and they'd say, what do you mean? And I'd say, bring supper, okay? And so they would bring supper. So we had groups every day of the week that would carry supper in, so they would fix it at home or at the office or wherever, and they would walk in and they would sit up on our countertop and they would put supper out and get, we'd tell them how many kids, and they would serve it to the kids, and then we got licensed, and the licensure said that people couldn't bring food cooked in their homes in because of the dangers that, uh, to associate that, and I said, what? Are you kidding me? And then I got to think about it, and I said, have we really been doing this all this time? Because <laughs> I'm like, have you seen some of the people that come in here? Yeah, I don't want to eat their food anymore. <laughs> Get that kids, are you kidding? I'm just kidding. So anyway, uh, it was a struggle because in the beginning, it created a whole lot of support for the coalition. Because you got all these people coming in nonstop, bringing food. And guess what they did when they came in? They loved seeing those little children. And then we said, can't do it anymore. We're licensed now. The state of Tennessee just took all my volunteers, okay, and that really happens. People quit coming. They didn't come back either. It's really, it's not easy to keep that connection with people until you can give them an access point to serve in those arenas in which they can have the same experience that you know they could have. And that means they've got to be able to be hands-on when it comes to this kid and how you impact those kids. So, let's go all the way back to the beginning. So, why did we start what we started? Well, in my head, one is because I don't believe that we ought to have 13-year-olds running around, that nobody has spotted anything in their life that's gone haywire like the one that created the life of Dominic, my 13-year-old boy. It, it just makes no sense that nobody saw it. And, and somebody, if the school system didn't, but she was in an after-school program, I promise you we do, because we, we may call it DHS probably twice a month. 
that's total abuse. That, that's simply all abuse. Of it. That, that's more than neglect. Okay. That, that's a kid. Um, who, how about this? I'll give you a story of a kid who came in who comes in every day. My staff takes a pair of his jeans and underwear home personally and washes to bring back because the next day they know he will have used the bathroom inspector. Because he watched his dad die on the couch. And he's never gotten over it. He's eight years old. But there's no help because they're not going to get help because they can't afford help. They don't know anybody to help them. So what do you do? You, you've got to keep loving the kid just like we did Dominic. See, one of the things I learned is after we got Dominic and realized that he had all this damage, we took all these special classes on how to deal with a 100% brain damaged child. And we got to be really good at it. That's why he's as good as he is today, right? There were no classes. We just put him right in the middle of five other kids that didn't know any better but to love him like we did. And he uh, became what he was in the midst of. It's just my story, that's all. So what I know with my kids at Coalition is if we put them in the midst of a place where they have people who care for them, and that they have steady, safe, focused direction, guess what our kids start to become? Exactly what you want them to productive, Safe. Uh, confident. Capable. But I sometimes only have them an hour and a half to three hours out of 24. Because I have people all the time who look at me and go, what, what impact are you making? Well, I will tell you, we just got done with an 18-month evaluation by uh, Dr. Marine, uh, Marine Morroy uh, that, that you know gives us a great evaluation on the impact we're making in his lives using a triangulation evaluation that uh, I don't know all this big words out of this letter do it and we came out really good. How about that? And it, and it dealt with administration, schools, teachers, parents, and kids uh, walked us out and so we do know what impact we're making but still it's limited because you have a small window so when we started, it was to work with Tyler Parkman's kids, but today, um, at 400 plus kids, we, and really, it's when you look at those numbers, I've got 278 kids in the school education program, and then I have another program in the evening, it's got a different name, that's that, that's that extra three year time, uh, where they do other things, I've got about 175 kids in that program, and, and so in, non, in the nonprofit world, how many of you know, that you got to show numbers to impress people. It, it's just, I mean, people are going to give you money according to whether or not you can impress them or not. So people play with numbers all the time in the nonprofit world. I struggled with this for years. So the reality is, I have 278 kids in this education program. I have another 175 in this evening program. So how many kids have I got? It's a math major. I got 448. Nine. No, really, I only have 278 because 175 are the same kids. They're in a different program. But if you add them up, it sounds real cool, right? <laughs> and that's what people say because they add all those numbers up. And I, I just learned the system. I'm just telling you, the nonprofit world's kind of crazy because everybody's after money. And you got to figure out how to write it so that people will say, wow. And then they'll give you money so that you can do what you do so you can impact more kids. But I know I'll never impact all the kids that come in my program. The point of it is, if I can impact 6 out of 10, and I got 600, I'll impact more than that number if I have 1,000. So my goal is how many kids can I get, because I know my percentage. And if I can make that impact on my percentage, it's not about being really big. It's about knowing that more kids get impacted and their lives will be different if I can get them in a program, which means i got to get big. Not to be big, just impact the kid. And the only way I can do that is if I have people who decide that this is a mission in their life, because they really want to make a difference in some form or fashion that has a capacity to really walk away when they go home and say, that was really cool. That, that, today was really cool. Let me tell you what happened. And they tell the story of the little girl who they sat down beside at supper time and they call her putting chicken down in her pocket of her dress. And when they said, what's going on? She was new. They didn't know her mom. And so she said, we don't have any food. So mom comes in. She has a hearing problem and speech impediment. And you find out they're living in a U-Haul. Running from dad in North Carolina. Afraid to tell anybody. Afraid the kids be taken. Which they would, wouldn't they? 
And so they don't get up at night time because they're hungry like I did last night at 3 in the morning to go eat a bowl of Cheerios. I did. <laughs> Just so I could tell I did this. <laughs> and I was thinking about this all night long. I thought, what else could I do? So I'll, I'll get up at 3 and eat Cheerios. No, I'll tell that story. That's what I'll do. <laughs> so, you know, she... she she couldn't get up from anywhere because she was laying in the front seat of the U-Haul. With a mother who can't communicate, struggles so she can't get help, afraid to get help, and can't tell anybody. And a little girl, eight years old, who's putting chicken in her dress pocket. So you know what we did? We turned them in. No, we got them help. We also fixed some food to take them away. Every night until we got them help and got them to people who could help them because we can't help her to find but we can help her. Seashell story, y'all didn't know the seashell. I'm sorry, the starfish. Please do something for me. Acknowledge me at some point. <laughs> y'all didn't know the starfish. Okay, three of you. So the rest of you didn't grow up. Um, <laughs> get on Facebook. You'll read someone. I see it, really. I know you probably never heard of Facebook. It's your age, right? They don't do that anymore. Just don't get uh, Starfish story is the guy who walks in there all the starfish and and he's picking them up, throwing them back in. And he meets a guy, and the guy says, What are you doing that for? And he says, Well, you know, it's a starfish, you know, they'll die if they don't get back in the water. He said, You have to look at the thousand. He said, What difference can you make? He picked one up, and he said, Made a difference to that. It's a real old story that I'm amazed that, you know, us old people had to retell and find out the ways they've heard of. It's a great story, and I just came up with that. <laughs> And so, you know, now, let me, let me stop a minute. Our summertime program, by the way, does kind of the same thing, except we start in the morning at 730. Um, we are always back. We registered, I think, 275. That's kind of the number for us. you got to stop there. It's a funding issue. Um, and uh, uh, they come, you know, they come in the mornings, and, and we go uh, swimming twice a week. We divide the groups up into two places. So one, one group's on campus during the day that the other group's go. So that's the only way we can manage that kind of number. So uh, one group, um, uh, we do breakfast in the morning. Uh, we do uh, uh, lunch at you know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, um, and a snack in the afternoon around 3. Before the kids go home, by 5.30, they're all gone. Uh, we'll go swimming twice a week. We'll go on an education field trip once a week uh, somewhere. Um, they will get free time. We will do everything from reading to uh, just fun time outside to uh, to uh, some faith teaching, uh, all of which is volunteer for them to pick where they want to go and be in whatever part they want to be in. One of the differences about the coalition and some of the other programs you're ever going to hear about, as far as working with children, is we uh, are not a community center. We are not a place where you can come if you want to because we're in your area. You have to be referred, you have to be accepted, and you have to attend, or we don't keep. I don't believe you can make a difference in kids' lives by allowing them and their parents to use you as a baby. Coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. So if they can get out of my program when they can sit in my program, after a few misses, we'll ask you to either decide you're going to stay or you can go. i got too many kids that need us that will come because the parents will say, I really need them. And they will come and they will stay. And when they stay, i got a chance of making a difference. We won't make it every one of them right, but I'll make it one of them. If I can get it. And if I can keep it. And we can't do it for all of them. We can't do it for some sort of summer program kind of operates like that. So we do breakfast, lunch, and a, a snack in the mid-afternoon. I'm requiring you to ask a question. Just because you look really asleep. Um, no, macro guy is about to sleep. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. You okay. said, seriously, man, I don't want to take away. But you've got to speak louder. Um, I was wondering how you dealt with families and friends that you didn't I thought you were, what, no, what, no, I said it like a what, weird way. No, you didn't. What she said was, how do you deal with people who can come to you? How do you deal with families and or kids that, you know, who are coming to you and have a tendency to, be, to take advantage of you? And I'm thinking, is she talking about my family? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like my teenagers. My house and my wife. What are you talking about? How do you know like us? People, what did I do? Right? What? <laughs> the lady calls me up, uh, literally, the lady calls me up, yes, um, I'm sorry, for those of you that they, uh, mentioned it, I'm just going to, just a little statement. I do pastor a church, 
and it's really interesting, when people find out I'm the Coalition for Kids guy, I ask for church, they will come to my church so that they can come to the Coalition for Kids and ask for money. They come to the church to try to tell me, oh, you've got a great church, I really love it, can you help me? You know what my answer is? No, I really can't. But really, I take them on one at a time, and this is the truth. Um, I take every single case on one at a time. When it comes to families in need, if my staff know them, and my staff know their history, and my staff, because that's a real key. The biggest key in making a difference in those families' lives, that's bigger than what we do here. Now, two things. One is, we have to keep our focus on what our goals are, the coalition, or we will try to fix the world, and we will not be good at it. When we try to help the moms and dads, and we try to help the family, and we try to help the living conditions, and we try to help all that, we get really wide, and I think the wider you get, the thinner you get. And I want to be really deep, and so we stay focused. We do homework. We do education. We do kids. We do not do parents. But if you, as my staff, want to help those parents, you are more than welcome to. You can counsel them. You can sit with them. You can be their friend. But we ain't doing parenting class. We're not, you know. And so uh, a, a family will, the, the dad will leave. This is just true stories that I've just experienced. The dad will leave and leave the family with nothing in an apartment. With absolutely, he'll take it all just to go. And the word will come through my staff and to me. And we will, I'll simply put the word out to all my contacts. And we will begin to influx them with support in some form. But the Coalition for Kids does not do anything except the best we can. And I just happen to have been around. Let me tell you, there's something big about being here for a long period of time. You want to know how to create regional support? That was one of the terms we used for this very setting. It's be somewhere for some time. You can't just walk in and gain credibility. It'll never happen. But if you show sustainability and you show credibility through time, People will expect you and respect you by responding when you have an issue. So that's what we tend to do. People have a, an issue. You now, when I deal with uh, folks that I simply think are, I, I'm really told about it. Because they, I'm on a list. I've, I've learned the system. I'm simply on a list. I, tell them, I just tell them, no, they have, I can't help. And I tell them where they can go to get help. And they'll always give me a reason for why the whole act, they won't help me. And I go, I know, there's a reason. They have criteria in place. And so we, we just move on. We used to bother me, doesn't bother me. Anymore. No, not a lack of compassion, just a clearing of what I'm here to do. Question. Sleepy guy in the back. Still not got anything? All right. You, you go throw it out. Go ahead. So what's the age limit on these children? What's the, what age are we talking First to eighth grade. So six to 13, 14 years old. We just went to seventh grade last year. We just started eighth grade this year. We're considering ninth grade next year. Oh, I'll go where I'm going to go now, and I'll take your question first. So, six, uh, so first to eighth grade is kind of the path. I'm considering going to the ninth grade. Eric, when we got two future perspectives on, well, we got multiple. One is, uh, do we go to the twelfth grade and or through college? By no longer can you take a kid. You all know this, right? You tell me I'm right. I need you to tell me I'm right. You're okay when I tell you this. Okay, no longer does a kid who's in high school want to come to an after school program by the way, right? right. I mean, that's not going to happen, right? I can go to the mall. I can, I can go anywhere I want to go, right? I, we're in Johnson City. We're not in the inner city of Atlanta. I went to the inner city of Atlanta. I went to a school that has, I don't know, they have 600 kids after school that don't leave the building. You know why? Because you wouldn't walk 100 feet. It was so horrid outside. My kids in Johnson City, that's up for class, dude. Compared to that, our kids get out of school, they can walk to them all, right? They can go anywhere you want to go. So i got a competition to be able to impact the kid in high school that needs help just because I need to be able to get them somewhere where they're willing to go and want to go. That ain't easy when you can go anywhere you want to in Dodge City and not have a big issue because your friends will give you a ride. Or, so we're trying to figure out how do we get to get a kid to stay in a program in the ninth grade or 10th through 12th so that we can push them into a college and walk with them. Right now, it's through the concept of social workers, which we call mentors at this point because they're volunteers. My future, I'd love to call them social workers where they were on staff for us, and they had five to ten kids each that they were walking with every week, meeting with one-on-one, -on -one, to occasionally having a group gathering with the kind of juniors. Somebody's already helping them with how to do their FAFSA and get them into a college and walking with them through college. Because the only way you will get a kid 
to, uh, to get them broken from their generational path, which you've heard that term, I'm sure, forever, into a new path, is if you get them to divorce the thinking of their parents. Now, I'm not condemning the parents. I'm saying that the parents' thinking will have a tendency to condemn the child. They will say things like, for example, uh, we took a child in when she was a sophomore in high school. The reason we took her in is because she came to stay the night with my third kid. My third kid's 20. So this was only about five years ago. So she comes to stay the night with my third kid. And you know how long she stayed with us? Three years. Because her dad had custody. Her mom was a low life. And I mean a low life. I, I mean, her mom had five kids, three different dads, no husbands, drug addict, stole money from her kids, couldn't ever stay anywhere anytime because she was constantly going in and out of jail. Her own daughter was now 14, who had just had a baby a couple years ago, and she would make her kids stay silent in their house with no electricity in the wintertime and not answer the door so DHS wouldn't find out that she's got kids that could be taken from her after she started lost through. Let me tell you more stories. It's a great place to work. So, so I, hope, I hope you guys make the connection to public health on this and, and, and literacy and the impact of family on public health. So I, I guess my question is, where, 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 can, where can we come in? What, what can our students do? What can we, I mean, what opportunities are there for them either through mentorships, volunteer work, or daily yeah, thank employment? You. I mean, what, what is there moving us that way? We've got 55 staff and about 6 to 800 volunteers a year. Um, we love when interns walk in our program. Now, you can do a whole lot of different projects or programs on your own if you come in and say, you know, I want to be an intern in your facility, or whether you're working directly with kids doing a specific reading project or a, a program that you want to do. Now, I clearly said that we want to start some new things such as um, uh, smoking cessation uh, impact, uh, nutrition, obesity uh, prevention, uh, and a specific reading program. What, what I shared with Colin um, and Dr. Wyckoff, which he came to our board uh, at, a, at a board meeting and spoke once, was the fact that we're looking at a, uh, a partnership that is going to address every child who cannot read in Washington County, the first, second, third grade. That is approximately, potentially, up to 800 kids that cannot read in the third grade. Uh, at third grade skill in Washington County. Forty two percent of the kids cannot read in third grade. Now you do understand that up to third grade you are learning to read and after third grade you are reading to learn. So if you cannot read by third grade, you are starting to go backwards at fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, by seventh grade when people talk about how tough it is, if you haven't been reading well for four years, you are now going way backwards. And at that point, graduating high school is not really exciting nor does it matter a whole lot. And when you don't graduate high school, I heard a really good speaker one time tell us that you can you will literally earn a million dollars less in your lifetime and live seven years less in this A County region. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna call him old, you better brag about it. <laughs> I skipped. Do you think that if kids that go to high school can't get a scholarship? Uh, every uh, as as you well know already. Every kid, if I can push them into vocational school, community school, can even now, with nothing, get a get a scholarship. The issue is, this is, I've got to get back to your question, but I answer, I finish. But the issue is not whether they can get a scholarship. Here's what takes place. Unfortunately, if you can't get them to mentally disengage from the thinking of their parents, I put this kid in college. She was my child's roommate in Nashville. They were living there, and by the end of the first semester, the mom landed on the doorstop, everything she owned in the car like she always does and her 14 year old 15 year old daughter with granddaughter and said honey you've got to come back home and get a job and guilt makes the child go back because mom has done so much and she can come back here got a job and started giving her money back to her mom it never went well after that what we want to do is put thank you doctor back by the way god bless you for everything you what we want to do is go in Washington County and put a program in every single county elementary school there is that's Kim. That means that I have to hire 130 folks to come on board. That means that I have, you know, right now we have an executive director, I've got an assistant, um, I've got a program director that is in charge of anything that's got to do with kids. I've got a full-time grant writer, a 
I've got to hire somebody to work with her. I've got a full-time director of finance. Um, I've got a full-time fundraiser uh, and events coordinator. I've got to hire somebody to work with her. Um, I, I've got uh, my program director. I've got to hire two more of those. So we're literally going really wide. I'm, I'm hiring um, uh, an HR person. Y'all know what that is? Human resource people. I'm hiring a human resource person to come on board with us full-time. Um, so we're going to grow really wide, but I've got to hire at least 100 people that are going to work hands-on with kids. Guess where I'm going to get them? Really, I may, I've already made a partnership with ETSU, Dr. Nolan, and Millie College. Because the worst thing we've ever done is hire people off the street to come and work with our kids compared to hiring folks who want to make a difference in their future, like interns like you, who can do a semester with us, and or like education majors, and or like social work majors, and or like what. And so make a, re a relationship with the college that we can get you positioned in a place where you go, I love working with kids. I think I want to be a teacher. I love working um, as the assistant to the grant writer. This is what I think I want. I love working in the marketing department. I love working in the HR department. I love working as a supervisor to people who work with kids because I'm really good at leadership like that. Some are, some not. Or you can learn in so much. And so we need you filing in their place as we walk into this. We're about nine months away from that. You, you mentioned that you don't uh, uh, keep the kids. So, uh, how do you have many cases of the kids that do not have where to go? Ask me that again. So, how do you have the kids that do not have like a place to stay? You talking about a home after they leave us? Yeah. Um, as far as homeless goes, now we work with the homeless of Johnson City, the program that works with the kids who are homeless. But honestly, um, I don't have kids that are truly homeless, as in without a home. If I know about it, I've got to report it, and they've got to be dealt with. Somebody's got to come in and take them. So either a parent will not tell me if they're homeless, or if they are homeless, they literally disappear out of our program. Because a parent normally is homeless because they're not paying rent, they owe somebody money, and they will move from Johnson City to Jonesboro. I had a kid who moved to 10 schools in one school year. And every time they'd move, Every other time, I'll say it that way, they landed in our program. And we'd say, hey, Johnny, you know, kind of thing. No, just because mama couldn't pay the bills. Had too many kids or whatever, you know, their life situation was. It's not a negative. It's just it was a bad situation. So we don't deal, I really don't see a homeless situation amongst our uh, demographic that we deal with. But I do deal with the homeless community uh, as far as organizations go, and they send their homeless kids to us, which means... There are people who are considered homeless, but in housing, because you're homeless if you don't have the same housing for three months, uh, that are in housing that will send their kids to us for us to help them. But there are no, we don't deal with any kids who are literally without a home. Because you got to turn, I don't mean that ugly, but you got to turn those in. you got to call DHS. You can't be without a home. You can't live in your car and, and me not say nothing. It's against the law. Are we mentioned safeguarding these several times this morning? Are they like Oh, in what category? No, I mean you said I mentioned something. Oh, okay, teen pregnancy. Uh, no, I, we haven't up to this point that I know of. I really, I, I will be honest with you. I, my organization has grown large enough to where I will, I will not know all the details because I'm not a micromanager, and I would tell you that's a good thing, um, that our staff do programs all the time, that I'm, I don't know all the programs that go on. Uh, I may go back and say, hey, do we do anything on in that? But our 7th and 8th graders are new. That's a brand new one-year-old program, and I could see us going to that instantly, you know, without a problem whatsoever. But 5th and 6th graders, we haven't done I don't think we've done anything like that at that point in time. Um, so, yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's that's in. in that's affected my life to a degree that literally I got my wife pregnant when she was 18 years old. Um, and that's how we met 20, almost 28, 29 years ago and ended up getting married and stayed married a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> well, we divorced after three years because we both had affairs on each other. And then we remarried and I took the two-year-old at the time and kept her for the next three years. And then she... Uh, came back up here after I moved up here and we remarried after that. So we've been, we sat together off and on for 28 years. 
We're just normal people. I know you think so much different because we're right now, but they're really not that cool. <laughs> I'm telling you. Who else? Uh, so, uh, go ahead. We don't. I don't know that I've now I get kids that come back when they hit high school and they'll pull in just got the driver's license. Sixteen years old. Uh, he was in our program. He was matter of fact, he was in our first first grade program. And at the time we went through six, so when he got out, when he turned like a sophomore high school or something like that, somewhere around there, he pulled in our parking lot, a little too fast, <laughs> um, you know, and got out, and he had a grin from ear to ear. I said, dude, what are you doing? He said, just wanted to come back, got my driver's license, say, hey, what's up? And I said, what's going on in your world? So a year later, uh, we found out that he's getting ready to, he got a full ride scholarship from Milligan College in business management because he started in a dance class in our program in the first through sixth grade. When he left that sixth grade class, he stayed with that dance instructor who was out of, gray, uh, out of Jonesboro, and they got him at the, where his scholarship was oriented to cheerleading at Melbourne College who stayed in that dance program. So that was kind of a cool story um, at, at which he is now working for me. So, uh, yes. One last question. What are, you, uh, what are the challenges you you are faced with the kids, and how did you handle them, and what are the ones that you are facing? One of the challenges that we face with kids, the little suckers don't mind worth a dime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you thought it's going to be an educational statement, right? No. Um, I mean, that's it. it. They don't have boundaries in their lives when they go home. They don't have support like many of us know support is intended to impact you. And, and so we have to realign them literally every day. You know what? The school system will call us and I'll walk in a school building in the principal's office and they'll have a kid sitting in the floor up against the wall because nobody knows what to do with him. And then they send him to us. And we ain't experts, don't get me wrong. But we can love him differently, it seems, than the school can, because the school don't have time to stop because they got 25 kids and not enough staff. And one teacher to 25, and we have three, four, or five. And we do stop. And we do sit. And we do learn that last night that child stayed up most of the night because the boyfriend, who was drunk and wild and had people over, and made the kids stand outside with no socks on waiting for the bus in a winter's night. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I done? <laughs> and I said y'all felt safe here, right? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Yo. Yeah, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters concept, I mean, mentoring older kids, younger kids. Um, matter of fact, we literally do um, mentoring programs for both our fifth and sixth graders, which we call lunch buddies, which means if you were to come to us, one of the places you could support would be, we would give you a kid to go eat lunch with every week at the intermediate school um, uh, in uh, Indian Trail, or you could be a mentor to a kid that's seventh or eighth grade, uh, as far as that goes. We did both those, but they're also both brand new, literally not fully kicked off yet. We just put those both in action because we think that that relationship is huge as they get older. Um, I was just wondering if your staff undergoes any training or anything like that to support for or, or um, uh, Required every year to see CFCC, which is a, a state led um, organization that does any uh, 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 child care last facility for free. So we get all our training for free in that regard when it comes to safe touch, when it comes to abuse. Um, we also do hours and hours and hours of training. We get the school system to give us some other training. We do outside training that we bring in everything from fluency to vocabulary training. Um, there's you know, special programs with that to uh, how to restrain a child. Because we get that on a regular basis um, where you have to figure out how to, how to restrain a child. So 
have a kind of a broad picture. Uh, but we are looking uh, for you, and again, I'm referencing back to the relationship. We are looking for you to say, I'd love to work in a place like that for a period of time. Um, come volunteer or be an intern or get a job or get all, do all, the, all those at the same time. Because we will never be without it, with everybody we need. We're always in need. All clear. How many hours do you work? I work about 80. <laughs> um, but that's because I have two jobs and kids. Um, uh, my staff, I'll, I literally will say that uh, the, most of my staff, 80% of my staff are part time guys. The hands on kids, guys with kids, that's our academic tutors. They will come in at, at 2.30 um, and work with kids till 5.30. So they'll get about 15 hours, unless they work that evening program, and they can get up to 25. If you're a, a supervisor of those, I'll get you. If you're a supervisor of those, then you can get uh, up to 30 and some more. Okay, so you get to be full time. That's when you get vacation and sick bay and all that fun stuff because that's all anybody wants to talk about. When can I get off? Um, and so they get vacation and sick bay and gosh, I'm full time and that's cool. Um, and then there's our what I call leadership, which are 40 hour week folks that kind of are salaried folks. And we have a lot of different core values that say, um, you're required to work whatever it takes when big projects show up, and you will also get to go home when your kid's sick or when you're sick, and I won't say a word to you, I just expect your job to get done. We have a big level of trust that goes on with our leadership, that I know their work's going to get done, and so we don't micromanage, we do evaluate on a regular basis, but we don't micromanage, but really, I will probably, I'll, you know, I'm a seven-day a weeker, so I'm kind of working 40 to 65 or so hours, I work in nine, nine. Yeah, this is really early for me because I quit going to work early a couple years ago. I just don't do it anymore because I work so late at night time yesterday. I know you said it, the program is going to be broken the street. Uh, Brian, you, you said you said you're going to have some money taking systems going. What's the way you provide any taking systems? The fee system uh, is a state uh, created fee system. So, literally, if you got on the internet and looked up the Department of Human Services, they have a fee system that's set up according to uh, how much income you earn. Um, I would tell you that 84% of my parents make under 20000 Of those 84%, if you split that in half and just set about 42%, 42% would make, it's really 41 and 43, but 41% make under $10,000 a year. And 43%, uh, I think, make up 20 and under. Um, so 85% of my families earn $20,000 or less, which means no matter what, you don't have to pay for anything, anywhere, anytime, when it comes down to it, especially in a program like ours. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you have six kids, and you're a minister, and you run this program. Where do you find time, or how do you like to take care of all your, yourself, personally? Well, I go, I, I go to the gym three to five days a week, sure to eat the That's kind of an ugly question right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, people are made different. I'm made with a high wire. Um, I also think that the concept of too much work and not play and all that stuff, I think it's for the birds. Uh, I, 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 here's what I've learned in, in my time of life, is that when you love what you do, burnout is not as common. Burnout comes when you don't love what you do and it's kind of a rough place to have to work and you still have to do it. But when you really love what you do, and I've never, I'm telling you, I've never gotten up a day in my life at this job and not wanted to go to work. With the worst conversations I've had to have with firing somebody, with having a horrible conversation with a child or a parent, I've never not wanted to go to work. Let me tell you something, that kind of, that kind of peace in your spirit, in your being, when you do that every day, and you find that place, and it's rare, I hate it for you, but most of you ain't going to find it, and it takes you, it took me until I, well, 18 years ago. But the deal was, up until that time, I'd opened up six different companies. And what I knew I was good at was, was entrepreneur. It was opening something. It was managing people. And I love serving people. So I was always doing the same thing, just a different category. And I always loved it. It's just I didn't like the making money thing. I liked the serving people part. But I wanted to figure out how to make money and serve people all at the same time, so I became a preacher. <laughs> Just kidding. The lies a lie. Please send your offerings. Um, so anyway, 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 
Um, I promise I'll help you pour. I promise. My poor kid. Um, so really, it's just totally oriented around this. Nothing more. I live by this. I mean, every single, every workout I do is in here. Every phone call I make is on a calendar. I calendar every single thing I live by. If you tell me I need to do something, it's on my calendar, and I literally will schedule my private time, my family time, my kid time, my ball game time. Everything I do is on my calendar, and I consider it to be a seven-day a week. I don't take days off. I take time off when time shows up, and I schedule it. But I'm in control of all that. It doesn't control me. Um, you said you do like the safe touch abuse those things. Do you ever have kids like voluntarily come to you and tell you that stuff? Like if they take the class and they're like, hey, this is what's going on at home, or do you just have to like infer it and just watch it? Um, and we'll end with this we'll end with this question. Um, two two months two months ago, um, I got a phone call and it said the police are here. Uh, uh, at the coalition, and it was about seven o'clock. We were heading to a dinner, me and my wife. Um, but it was a United Way dinner, so it was still a show up and shake hand thing, anyway. Um, and so we we're heading to a dinner, um, and my office calls and says the police are here, four cop guards, and a dad who has gone nuts on my staff. Okay, and I'm the bouncer, just so you know. I have a couple different jobs. One is I ain't afraid of whipping somebody. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just a different kind of freak to say that. <laughs> so, so literally, we got there, and what we found was, to your question, a young a lady uh, had written in her book that she wanted to tell a, a staff person, a coalition, that she uh, was afraid she was going to be raped. And so that was written in a journal that we had, and so we um, uh, called the parents. Now, this had been two days prior. We called the parents, told them what was going on, and on this day, the parent came in and wanted the journal that we had. And they, my staff wouldn't give it to him, which wasn't the right decision, but they wouldn't give it to him, and he went nuts. So he called the police and told the police that his daughter was being raped at the Coalition for Kids. That's how we got four cop cars out. Which I knew all the cops, so it's bad, his bad luck. <laughs> they were all my friends. Um, and, and so they, that's how they came. That's why there were four. And then they got the real story, which he was mad because he wanted a journal. Now I'm just going to say this out loud. My thinking as a dad, if I find out my daughter's writing about the potential being raped, my anger is not going to be about getting her journal back unless it's got something to do with me and her journal. But see, here's the issue. I can't do anything else about it. I may never see that kid again. I'm sorry, let me take that back. I won't ever see that kid again because they took that kid out of the program just like that. You know why? Because that's what happens when you get into people's private life and things aren't going on and people know what is going on. You will lose those kids just like that, so you have to make a decision. What do I do? Do I keep them in, work with them, or do I tell? Well, I don't have an option. We have to say that over and over and over and over. You don't have an option, you don't have an option, you don't have an option. You are a criminal if you do not tell. And so we tell. And we lose. Never see it again. So all I can do, thank God I pray. All that's all I can do. I, I really don't want to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you guys. There's some humor to it. I, I hope you guys sense how powerful this is and how you know, public health we have a lot of opportunity. So uh, we just felt, I guess, your time, the better safe our time is. If anybody wants, I don't know if you've got time. I do. I do. If anybody wants to stay out. I don't have anything to do. <laughs> 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 <laughs>